Hey guys, um, this video is for uh, chapter 9. Um, before I start, a couple of administrative things, um, I guess just one. Uh, thanks for sending me your homeworks. Um, I haven't started grading them um, yet, so I don't have specific feedback. Um, my plan is to make a separate video where I go through um, my solutions um, after I have uh, looked through and graded um, your um, your turn-ins. Um, and so look for that um, soon. My hope is to get started on those tomorrow and um, have them back to you uh, by, by Monday. Um, I'm recording this video in the evening in the hopes that I can get it posted by first thing tomorrow so that those of you that want to work in the morning uh, can do that. Um, and also for the homeworks, I didn't mention this, but um, most of you emailed me uh, as an attachment, which is fine, um, but you used my AFIT email, which is normally not a problem, um, but with the working from home situation and the VDI connection not always being super reliable and Outlook sometimes not letting me send emails with attachments to um, to private emails. Um, it'd be easiest probably if you guys just, just e keep emailing the homeworks but just send them to my personal email and her08 at gmail.com and that, that saves me a step. Um, so um, that's all I had so I'm gonna s switch over here put put me down picture in picture and then share with you my uh, notes for chapter 9 and so chapter 9 is the first chapter where we start to talk about um, the processing and we're laying the groundwork by talking about phase diagrams. Um, we started off, um, right, all through this course we've been talking about, we have this um, processing structure, um, properties performance relationship, right? And we started off with real basic talking about atomic structure and bonding, which is, which is structure, but not particular to any one type of material. Um, and then we talked about crystal structure and dislocations, again, helpful foundational topics, but not um, particular to any one material system. And then we switched over, we're talking about more of the properties, specifically for metals, right? We talked about um, strength testing, and then um, dislocation motion and failure, right? So we're talking about how um, we get certain properties or or sort of what certain properties metal metals can have, um, and uh, now we're shifting and we're sort of building building on that, so we can see okay these are the properties we want, and we're looking at okay um, what kind of structures can we get with these materials, and then um, also how do we create those structures right? And so the first step in that is talking about phase diagrams, because the properties that we ultimately get from our materials, right, come from their microstructure, right? It's processing gives you structure, structure gives you properties. Um, and so uh, the microstructure um, is dictated by the phase diagram, okay? So starting off with phase diagrams, um, we'll define some terms here. So um, in a phase diagram, um, you typically have two variables, right? Um, most commonly, uh, for the ones that we'll look at in this course, we have composition on the x-axis and temperature on the y-axis. So we see that you can vary the composition, right? And composition of what, right? Of the components, right? So phase diagrams have multiple components. Usually you're talking about a solute and a solvent, right? So solvents, just like if you were to use like an organic solvent or, um, or water, right? Solvent is the thing that you're dissolving into. So, you know, and then your solute is the thing that you are dissolving. So if you are, let's say, making sweet tea, right, your, uh, your tea would be your solvent and the sugar that you are putting in to make it sweet, right, would be the solute. 
Um, and so here we have actually a phase diagram for sugar in water. This is from our text, right? And so we have this line on here, right, that represents the solubility limit. And we see here that um, the composition that can be in solution, liquid sugar or liquid solution of syrup where this, the sugar is dissolved, right, that solubility limit is increasing as we go up in temperature, right, which is what you see when you, when you make sweet tea. If you really want it to be super sweet, right, you need to add the sugar when it's hot, right, because at, at a higher temperature, right, the sugar is more soluble. Okay. And this solubility limit, this will come into play when we talk about phase diagrams too, because, you know, we're not talking about sugar in water, but we'll be talking about the solubility of certain elements in other elements. And this will dictate what phases we have in our various systems. And so what do we mean by phase? Right, when we talk about a phase, we're talking about a, a homogeneous um, material that has uniform properties. Um, and uh, different phases will have different physical and chemical properties. And if we combine them together, right, then we would get what we call a heterogeneous material, right, where we would have multiple single phases. And this is where doing metallography and looking at the microstructure would be most helpful because you can see um, the size and shape and distribution of these uh, different phases relative to one another. Um, okay. And so what we really want to see and understand is, is the microstructure and its connection to both processing conditions and final um, material properties. And this is um, the main goal of, of metallography. Um, those of you who are in 680, we talked about metallography where you uh, section and grind and etch material so that you can see the microstructure, right? You want to be able to see, okay, how is this structured at a at a at a, at a you know a individual crystal grain level, um, and is this the microstructure that we want to get the properties and performance that we want? And so what you see here is right. You see the number of phases present. You see um, how they are distributed, um, and and what proportions they have formed in, right? And that may be favorable for your application or or not, and um, allows you to tweak your processing to get a more favorable microstructure. Okay, um, and so when we're looking at a phase diagram, what we're looking at is equilibrium conditions, right? Every phase diagram is sort of predicated on equilibrium, meaning that for any uh, combination of variables, um, you are not going to have uh, uh, changes, right? It's going to be stable over a long period of time, and it isn't until you change the temperature or the pressure or the composition or whatever your variables of your phase diagram are uh, that you'll see a change in phase. Um, meaning that in a phytetic equilibrium, we're talking about, you know, the free energy being at a minimum. Right? So, um, <clears throat> and it's stable at equilibrium, although it says nothing about the rate, right? So it might be that over a long period of time, I could move to an equilibrium state. But if it takes a long time at that temperature to get there, practically I may never achieve it. Um, and so sometimes, well often in materials science, um, we uh, are, are uh, intentionally producing a non-equilibrium state. Um, and if we can um, achieve the right conditions, then it will be non-equilibrium, but essentially stable because um, it would take such a long time at the temperature to, to reach that equilibrium state that we can essentially treat a non-equilibrium state as being metastable or stable for, for our application. Um, and of course, these are all dependent upon the variables that we're changing, right? Temperature, pressure, composition. Um, the simplest phase diagram would just be with one component. Right, so here we wouldn't actually have composition as a variable because it's one component, right? The composition doesn't change it. It's pure for, for, for all conditions. And so here we would generally not plot, say, temperature versus composition, but instead we would plot, say, pressure versus temperature, right? And so here we have the phase diagram for water. And so you can see the temperatures and pressures over which the various phases of water are present um, at, low at 
at uh, low temperatures, obviously you have ice. Um, at high temperatures, obviously you have steam. Um, and then sort of um, in between for reasonable pressures and reasonable temperatures, right, you, have, um, you have water. And in between each of these phases, you have a phase boundary. And along this boundary, you can have water and, um, well, you have the two phases on either side that are in equilibrium with each other. So, um, right, at, at standard, at one atmosphere of pressure, um, at zero degrees, right, I can have water and, li and ice at, um, exist simultaneously indefinitely. Um, Right. If I go up to a higher higher temperature, eventually all my ice will melt. If I go to a lower temperature, eventually all my water will freeze. And the same thing goes for uh, water and steam at 100 C. Right. And the triple point of water here is where you have the intersection of all three phases. And actually, um, ice water um, and um, water vapor can coexist um, at that particular point. Okay. Um, Single component phase diagrams not so useful for material science. Um, more often than not, you'll see at least at least two. This is a, a binary phase diagram, two components, and so here is where you're most likely to see temperature and composition as your axes. Uh, temperature is generally the y, and composition is the x. And so, since pressure is no longer variable, it needs to be fixed. What uh, pressure do we pick? Do we pick? Well. Um, the most relevant one would be uh, uh, constant one atmosphere, right? So we're going to take this material and put it out into, um, you know, normal environment, which is, you know, one atmosphere plus or minus a little bit, kind of neglecting any, um, any um, applications, say, at high altitudes or maybe, you know, um, under, under the seas. Um, and uh, these comp and, and so phase diagrams of this type are key to understanding the microstructure and because they show um, what phases we can expect to get at various temperatures and compositions which is which is going to be key to um, tailoring our material properties right so what composition do you pick and what temperature do you process it at right you're going to make those decisions based on understanding of the phase diagram Okay, so our first binary system that we'll look at is copper and nickel. Now, copper and nickel are both transition metals. They're relatively uh, close to each other on the periodic table. They have very similar um, size and um, valence and electronegativity. And so, like we saw before for solid solutions, we would predict that copper and nickel would have a very high solubility. In fact, it is actually what we call homogeneous. Um, Meaning, and I guess maybe miscible would be another term you might use, although that might be more used in liquids. Um, but uh, copper and nickel is, they are soluble in each other um, over the whole um, span of composition, right? So you can go from 0% nickel, uh, pure copper, all the way up to, to pure nickel with zero, with zero copper, and you're going to have a solid, um, a stable uh, solid solution. Um, phase uh, anywhere in between, right? So generally we uh, give uh, solid solutions or phases um, lowercase Greek letters. Um, and so if you have one phase, generally that would be alpha. And so here we see that at um, a low enough temperature, we're going to have a solid, right? We're not melting at lower temperatures. So we're going to have this solid phase here, alpha, and um, there is a boundary between this solid alpha phase and the um, liquid and alpha uh, region. And this boundary is called a, the solidus, right? which makes sense. It's the boundary between solid and, and anything that has a liquid component. And so then you have this narrow region where you can have solid um, and liquid coexisting, and then if you go up and higher and higher in temperature, you will cross the liquidus line. This is the line that, like you would expect, separates the liquid from things that have any solid component. Um, and you see here that the solidus line uh, connects the melting temperature of 
pure copper uh, linearly to the melting temperature of pure nickel, right? Which makes sense because as you transition from pure copper add more nickel, right? You're obviously going to end up at pure nickel, right? So you should have uh, basically a straight line connecting them, and, and you do. Um, and all of these lines, so it's liquidus, solidus, um, those terms aren't used uh, too too often. Um, generally, you would just refer to them as a tie line, right? And these boundaries will become uh, important for um, for uh, predicting what the composition is of various phases that form, um, as we'll see later. Um, oh, I guess we'll cover it right now. Okay, so generally we use these tie lines to um, um, determine the composition of different phases, um, and, and we use a rule referred to as the Lever rule, right? So here's an example from the nickel copper base diagram shown above, kind of zoom in on this portion between 20 and 50 percent nickel. And um, if we are in the region here where we have alpha phase and liquid um, that are stable together, um, let's say we are, you know, at that, this composition looks like about 35 weight percent. Um, so as we're cooling down, when we cross the liquidus, we will start to solidify some alpha. And to determine what the composition of that alpha is, you use a tie line um, that tie together these uh, boundary lines. Um, and then you can use that tie line to estimate what the composition would be of the alpha phase forming and then the composition of the remaining liquid. So we'll use this diagram here as an example. We're not quite at the boundary. We've cooled down a little bit further. But at this particular temperature, right, we're forming alpha phase. And to figure out what the composition is of that alpha phase, right, you draw a line that is parallel to the composition axis. And where it intersects the either the solidus or the liquidus, you drop a line down to the composition, and that tells you what the composition of is the liquid and the alpha phase that is solidifying at this temperature. Right? So like we see here, um, right, you can give these, the, they use R and S to define the size of these regions. And so you'd see here that the uh, weight percent of liquid, right, so I would draw a line over here, and I would have at the S region, right, so it's actually the other side of the tie line, divided by the total length, which makes sense that um, the closer I am to the liquidus line, um, the, um, the larger this region would be and the more liquid I would expect to, uh, to have. And then if I drop this line down, I see that the composition of my liquid is somewhat less than I then say well let's just say 32 percent then if I draw the line across in a similar fashion and drop it down I see that my alpha phase is above 40 maybe 43 percent right and so it makes sense that if I'm at 35 nominal composition for the entire sample right if I'm solidifying alpha phase that is a higher composition of nickel than that then I must be pulling it from somewhere and so the liquid should be left with um, less nickel um, as I as I'm solidifying more of that alpha phase, right? But as I go down, I'll see that uh, my solidifying alpha um, will um, I'll get more alpha, and it will more closely approximate my nominal composition. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, so with a binary phase diagram. And so um, we'll talk a little bit about um, microstructure development in a binary phase system like copper nickel. Um, and uh, it's important to note here that we're talking about slow cooling. So at every point, the assumption is that we are able to achieve equilibrium. Um, this is not often true. But for this example, we're, that's the assumption we're making. So if we have, again, 35 weight percent is our, is our alloy composition. And if we heat it up, say, to 1300 C, right, we'll be in a fully liquid state. That's what our phase diagram is telling us. If we cool down from there, we'll have liquid until we hit this uh, liquidus line here. And that's where we start to solidify. And the phase that we're solidifying into is alpha phase. And so in the melt, we're going to nucleate various grains of alpha phase, right? We'll have groups of atoms that 
bump into each other and happen to stick. And since we're cooling down, they're less likely to unstick. And so more atoms stick and those grains grow. Um, right at this boundary, I'm making alpha phase. I draw my tie line across and drop it down. I see that my alpha phase is 46% nickel. So I have these, these high uh, nickel content alpha uh, grains that are forming. And then as we cool down further and further, um, we are solidifying more alpha around the outside of these grains. I can draw my tie line across and I see that the composition of alpha phase as I grow my grains outward, sort of like the tree rings on a, on a tree, I have rings and each successive ring has less and less alpha or less and less nickel in it as I move uh, down through this region. Um, and so at, at this point C, I'm at 43% nickel and I, you know, my, my nickel content of my liquid continues to drop. As I get down to the bottom, here, I'm almost completely solidified. And so the outside layer here is uh, 35% nickel. Um, and uh, the liquid is down with 24% nickel. Um, and then so at this point, I've run out of melt. And by the time I get to point E, right, I have fully solidified alpha grains with a nominal overall composition of 35% of weight percent nickel, which matches what I started with. Um, and so well, I mentioned about this chord structure. I may have gotten a little bit ahead of myself here. Remember I said that this is equilibrium. So even though I'm solidifying at a higher percent nickel, the assumption is that the temperature is still high enough that as I solidify the next layer, that's a lower weight percent nickel, the higher uh, percent of nickel in the interior is able to diffuse out and give me an overall composition of 35. Um, however, that takes a long time, especially as I cool down, right? Diffusion slows down, we saw that before. And so uh, cooling almost never happens slowly enough to allow this equilibrium to be maintained, right? And so we get this chord structure that I alluded to before. Um, as, you know, diffusion is slow, especially in the solid phases. And so when you first solidify, like I said above, you're getting a high nickel content grain um, cores. And every successive layer is going to have a lower nickel content. And under normal conditions, there's not enough time and temperature for those atoms to diffuse back out. And so you end up with a cord structure. Um, and gives you an intergranular concentration gradient, right? Meaning within one grain, you have a concentration gradient of nickel. And this is actually undesirable because that means that at your grain boundaries, you have a uh, material that is going to melt initially at a lower temperature. And so that gives you less uh, temperature resistance and it means that at that lower temperature, your material is essentially gonna fall apart at the inner granular level. And so um, it may be desirable um, to have a post um, solidification heat treatment to allow that diffusion to occur and diffuse some of that nickel out of the core and into the rest of the grain. <clears throat> okay, so if you have a material like this, what are the mechanical properties that you can expect? Well, remember what happens as you start with a pure material and add in impurity atoms. Right? Um, even if it's a good match like copper and nickel, it's still not perfect. And so putting a nickel on a copper atom site is going to disrupt that crystal structure. Right? And then when I disrupt that crystal structure, like we saw in uh, two, two lectures ago, um, it's more likely that um, I will have a dislocation that co-locates with that impurity atom. And that reduces the energy of both, which means that if I'm going to move that dislocation, which is what I mean by yielding, then I'm going to need to overcome that energy gain that I had, right? I'm sitting in an energy well, essentially, and so I'm gonna to have to put in energy to get out of that well and move that dislocation. And so as I add more nickel, I have more of that copper lattice distortion, more of that um, impedance or impediment to dislocation motion, and my tensile strength increases. Right. Um, at some point here, I get to the point where I'm no longer thinking about having a solid solution of nickel and copper. 
Instead, it's more appropriate to think of a solid solution of uh, copper and nickel, in which case the tensile strength could go back down because um, I have a pure material again. It's just a different one. It's nickel instead of copper. And so I see the tensile strength peaks here somewhere around you know, 40 to 60, you know, say 60% in this case, which is about half and half. So you'd have kind of a, a peak amount of, of lattice disruption. And then so uh, normally we would see, remember, tensile strength and ductility are inverse, right? So this is a good example of that, where just as I'm reaching peak tensile strength, right, I'm reaching the minimum of my elongation right, or my ductility. Okay, so um, what happens if we have a binary system, but it's not isomorphous, meaning that um, I don't have 100% solubility of my components, right? That would be the case of copper and silver, and this forms what we call a binary eutectic system, right? And in this case, we actually have um, three phases, um, alpha and beta, which are both solid phases, and then the liquid phase. And the alpha is a copper-rich phase, with a relatively low solubility limit, right? I can only put so much silver into copper. And then on the other side of the phase diagram, I have beta, which is a copper rich, all right, a silver rich phase, right? So likewise, I can only put a small amount of copper into silver. Um, and so any composition in between is gonna have a mixture of alpha and beta phases. And also I'm gonna have regions where I have alpha in liquid and then beta in liquid. Um, but aside from those differences, right, uh, we can think about this phase diagram in a similar way and use the tie lines and the lever rule just like we did before. Um, the main addition that we add in here is this eutectic point. Um, the eutectic point is uh, actually is the point, it's kind of similar to a triple point on a water phase diagram, um, but it's the point at which solidification occurs directly from 100% liquid to 100% solid. And when it does so, it, it, it solidifies directly from liquid into alpha and beta phase together. And it forms a distinctive structure that we'll, we'll talk about um, later. Um, the other thing uh, that to notice is that generally the eutectic point is uh, the lowest melting point of any composition. And so um, eutectic composition is often used for applications that require a low melting point metal. Um, one, one example that comes to mind is solder for making electrical connections. Um, you'll notice here, this is a more of a legacy material, but we have tin or lead tin solder, right? This was used for many years um, as, the, as the solder material of, of choice. And the composition there was about 62% um, lead, or, no, I read that backwards, 62% tin in lead. Um, and at that, at that composition, right, the melting temperature is 180 C, so it makes for good solder. If you were to have, say, 100% lead, right, then your melting temperature goes up to 327, and 100% tin is 232, so the composition gives you a reduction, say, of you know, 50 degrees C or so. Now, lead tin solder has fallen out of favor because of the toxicity of lead, um, you know, leaching out into groundwater from landfills or into the air from incinerating, you know, incinerating trash. Um, and so, uh, increasingly, the, the manufacturing world has transitioned to lead-free solder, so no more lead. Um, here, we're looking at generally one, one you know, dominant material. Is, is instead of using uh, lead tin, we're using lead bismuth. But same idea applies. Um, it forms a binary eutectic uh, structure. And at the eutectic composition here, um, we have the lowest melting point. Um, here, in this case, it's 139C, so even lower than the lead tin solder. Uh, but it's the composition that has the lowest melting point uh, at that eutectic point. OK. So if we have a, a, eutectic, a binary eutectic system, what kind of microstructures do we develop? Well, that is composition dependent. So we'll go through a couple of different cases here at different compositions. Um, if we have uh, very low levels of impurity, 
right? So in this case, we're talking about, um, say, 1% tin in lead. Um, we would form a microstructure that is similar to the isomorphous phase diagram, in which case we're starting, from, we can kind of almost disregard the other phase because we have such a low level that even though the solubility is limited, it's enough for the low levels that we have. So here we start off at a liquid. As we pass into the region of alpha and liquid, we will start to solidify grains of alpha phase. Um, and once we pass through the uh, solidus line here, we will have it solidified completely to alpha. And since we're in this region here where we don't have um, any beta at all, at this low level, um, I can solidify all the way to room temperature and I'll have alpha grains um, and that's it. If I have a higher composition of tin, um, I'll, again, I'll start out in liquid. As I pass into this region, I'll solidify grains of alpha. Um, and then I will uh, pass through this liquidus line into this alpha region, which means that at this particular composition, say 15% tin, at a high enough temperature, right, I can have enough solubility. But the solubility limit decreases with temperature. And so as I go to room temperature, I'm inevitably going to pass into this region where I have alpha and beta phase. Now I have already solidified here, right? So I'm not gonna grow from the melt. Instead, what I will have is diffusion of tin out of alpha phase, right? Because I have gone down below the solubility limit. I'm below this line, and so the alpha cannot hold all of that, all of that tin, right? It is rejected because of the mismatch and the uh, low solubility. And it's rejected into these other little grains of beta, right? So I get little grains of beta that form within the alpha phase. And this is actually um, a, um, a mechanism that we will study later for strengthening a material, right? These little phases, these little particles of a different phase actually have a strengthening benefit. Uh, for, for certain material systems if their phase diagram looks like this. Okay, but what happens if we solidify, if we have a, a composition right at the eutectic composition? Well here, we don't pass through a region where we have a phase and a liquid. We go straight to the two solid phases um, and we're gonna form a, a uh, what is referred to as, I guess, a eutectic microstructure. And as we're passing from the liquid into the solid phase, right? We are forming both alpha and beta at the same time from the liquid, right? So we don't have this situation where we have a already existing grain structure of one phase and we are precipitating out another phase. Here we're forming both directly. And so we get this eutectic microstructure with this striped appearance because we have diffusion of, of one type of atom in one direction and the other type of atom in the opposite direction to form these uh, alpha and beta phases that are both, that are rich in opposite atoms, right? So here we, in the liquid, we have kind of a homogeneous mixture. When we form these distinct and very different composition phases, we need to diffuse those atoms in opposite directions. And so that diffusion length has a limit. And so as these grains are solidifying, right, they can only diffuse so far. And so we get these bands these alternating bands of alpha and beta material within the, within the grains, um, and this is referred to as um, the eutectic structure. And if we solidify right at the eutectic composition, right, that's all we're gonna get is this eutectic structure. However, what happens if we cross uh, inside of one of these um, regions here where we have one phase and a liquid and then pass into the alpha and beta region. Well here we're going to get different microstructure, right? Different composition, different uh, heat treatment, different microstructure. Um, in this case we are, this would be called a hypo-eutectic because the composition is less than the eutectic composition. But here we start with a liquid. As we cool down we're going to pass into this region where we start to nucleate alpha phase those alpha grains will grow. Um, and uh, here's where the tie line and the lever rule can come into play. Remember, um, at H here, I'm growing alpha grains, right? And if I draw this tie line across here, I can see that my alpha grains would be growing. 
I drop a line down in composition, say at you know 18 percent um, tin, which means that um, I'll come across here and say my liquid has then, uh, since I'm rejecting, right, because my composition here is at 40 percent, I'm growing alpha that is low tin, so I have to be rejecting the tin into the liquid. And so I see here that the composition of my liquid is increasing as I move down here, right? By the time I get to point L, I'm almost completely solidified. Or not, well, as I get to point L, um, I am, um, yeah, almost completely solidified. And the composition of the alpha has increased um, a little bit. Um, but the but the uh, since I've been rejecting tin into the liquid this whole time, I've been moving down this line, and eventually the remaining liquid will be at the eutectic composition, which means that right as I pass through here, this last little bit, it doesn't solidify as alpha, it actually solidifies as eutectic. So what I get is a microstructure that has uh, grains of or particles of alpha phase in surrounded by eutectic. Right? And the closer that I am to the eutectic region, right, the more eutectic I'll get and the less alpha phase. And conversely, the closer I am to this alpha region, um, the more alpha I'll get and the less eutectic, right? which kind of makes sense. If I start way over here, right, I've got to move down quite a bit before I get to this point, in which case um, most of the liquid has solidified already. Um, and to kind of formalize this and give you some formulas, um, we can define these various regions here. Um, here they, they use uh, the letters P, Q, and R to define these regions. Um, and here we would have um, the weight percent of eutectic versus liquid. We're looking at P versus Q uh, ratios. And then this alpha prime is talking about, um, I think, pre-eutectic alpha. So that would be the alpha that is formed here before we pass through the eutectic. Um, and so here we can kind of disregard this R region and then this um, weight percent of just alpha, that would include both the pre-eutectic alpha that's formed before we form the eutectic, and then also the portion of the eutectic that is alpha phase, right? Because remember, we're looking at a eutectic that's alternating stripes of alpha and beta phase. Okay. And then conversely, you would have weight percent of beta. Okay, but it's a review. So this was, remember, phase diagrams are, new, are, are not our equilibrium. That's the assumption. Um, generally, we cool faster than that. And so for fast cooling, two things happen, right? One is that your primary uh, constituents will be cored, um, meaning that the inner part of the grain will be higher concentration than the outside. And also, you're going to form more eutectic phase than you would under slow cooling under equilibrium conditions. Okay, so this binary um, eutectic phase diagram is still on the simpler side of things. Um, what you'll find when you're looking at most materials is that the phase diagram is much more complex with many more phases um, and smaller, smaller regions. Um, uh, generally, um, you won't have what are called uh, terminal solid solutions in every case. Right, terminal meaning that um, that uh, you can go all the way down to a pure material, and the phase is still is still present. Um, that's what we have in this uh, copper silver phase diagram. Right, both alpha and beta are terminal phases. Um, you might have uh, an intermediate solid phase, and so that would be um, something that's not that that's not a uh, could not be is not connected to a pure material, but is somewhere um, in an in intermediate uh, composition. Um, but, but the rules that we talked about still apply, as you'll see. Um, we also have the formation of intermetallics. So this is represented on a phase diagram as a straight line. And this is more of like, say, like an ionic compound, meaning that there is a set stoichiometry. In this case, this example, this is um, Mg2, PB, so uh, two atoms of magnesium, one of lead, right? If I take the atomic masses of these atoms, um, right, I find that 81% of the mass is in the lead atom, 
And so that's the composition. The weight percent is at 81, right? And if I combine two magnesiums and one lead, I'm always going to get 81% lead, right? So this compound forms only at one composition, right? That's called an intermetal. Um, we also have other transitions that can occur that we haven't covered yet, which are very similar to what we talked about. So um, a eutectic is technically transition from a liquid phase to two solid phases. But you could have the transition between from one solid phase to two solid phases, right? No liquid phase involved. This is what, actually what we see in steels. And this isn't called a eutectic, it's called a eutectoid. Um, and you could also have a, a paratectic, which is similar. You go from one solid phase to a liquid and a different solid phase. Um, that one is not as common as the eutectoid. Um, some more uh, terminology. Uh, congruent transformations is where you would have a phase change and no composition changes. This is like melting pure metal. Or an incongruent transformation, and that's what we're seeing most likely, where we have a phase change and also a composition change. That's what we talk, that's what we'll see in eutectic systems. Okay. Um, and so when we're talking about, you know, um, number of variables and phases and number of components, um, it's helpful. Um, Gibbs, who is the same guy behind like Gibbs Free Energy, if you've ever heard of that, um, has a handy little rule here um, where he defines this relationship between the number of phases, the number of variables or degrees of freedom, and then the number of components and um, non-compositional variables. And so, you know, I'll kind of walk, walk through this in, in, you know, using a couple of, I use an example here. One we just looked at for this copper-silver system. So for this system, right, um, we're at constant pressure, atmospheric pressure, right? So the number of non-compositional variables, right, would be one, right? Composition is a variable, but it's not the non-compositional variable. So we just have temperature. So it gives us one. Uh, our components is two. We have silver and copper. And so that means that P plus F must equal three. Um, and so if we go to the phase diagram where P would be the number of phases, that's one, right? So if we go to say a region, say the liquid region, up at the top part of the phase diagram, P is one, which means that F, the number of degrees of freedom, is two. That means that within that region, we can vary composition and temperature and still have the same phase. Um, but if I pick a point on one of the lines, right, say the liquidus line, right? Now I have two phases that can coexist, which means that for any one composition, right, I can only, uh, I only need to define the temperature, right? And then I know what, I fully define my system. Just kind of a handy little thing. Okay, so um, I think the last thing, we'll, the last major topic in this chapter is the iron carbon, or to be more specific, the iron iron carbide phase diagram, right? And this is the one we'll use looking at steels. So we'll spend a lot of time with this phase diagram, and this will come back as we talk about um, later topics. But remember, steel, we have an iron uh, solvent and copper solute, right? And the copper is a small atom that goes into the interstitial spaces between the iron atoms in their crystal lattice. Um, and here you'll notice if you look at the x-axis, right, our composition actually only goes from 0 to 6.7 percent, right? So why doesn't it go to 100? Well, it does go to 100, right? The iron carbon system goes to 100, but Way over here, right, you get various uh, types of, of cast iron and you start to form uh, large particles of carbon or graphite. Um, and that's because the solubility of carbon in iron is actually quite low. And so a lot of the phases over here that we'd be interested in are actually a pretty low, low concentration. So we're going to focus in on these, you know, one, two percent uh, carbon portions of the phase diagram. Um, and uh, we have a couple, a number of phases here. Um, in this, we had a one to two percent 
uh, carbon region where we where we think of steels being, we have uh, our two main, or I guess there are three main uh, phases to be aware of. The first is um, alpha phase, which is in this region over here, right? It's very low solubility. Max solubility is only 0 0.022, um, so 0.2%. Um, and then we have uh, our other other eutectic phase, or eutectoid phase, which is um, Fe3C. This is an intermetallic. So this boundary over here on the far right at 6.7% carbon is actually the intermetallic for this Fe3C. Um, we uh, refer to that as cementite. So that's that other phase. So we have particles of cementite. So it's ferrite and cementite. And then the third phase to be aware of is, is right here, this, this gamma phase, which is austenite. And now austenite actually only exists at elevated temperatures, right? Once you cool down below 727C, you get transformation into um, ferrite and cementite. Um, also point out that ferrite is BCC crystal structure, and austenite is FCC crystal structure, which helps to explain why the solubility for carbon of ferrite is so much lower than the austenite, right? Because we're looking at the interstitial spaces. And even though FCC has a higher packing density than BCC, the interstitial spaces are larger, which means it's more, it's easier to accommodate more carbon atoms, right? And so this is helpful for making a lot of our, our um, our microstructures because with austenite you can make a solid solution with a much higher carbon content right about a you know a two percent so a hundred times more carbon you know is soluble in austenite than in ferrite which we make use of in in, in making various steel microstructures as we'll see later in the course okay so when we're developing microstructure in an iron iron carbide or iron carbon system. Um, we're talking about slow cooling here. We'll talk about faster cooling um, in later, later chapters. Um, and the composition that we'll be interested in here is at the eutectic composition, 0.76 weight percent carbon, right here, right? So this should look familiar, this general layout for this phase diagram. It's very similar to what we talked about uh, a few minutes ago with the copper, um, with, yeah, the, yeah, silver and copper. And so if you're at this composition and you cool, right, you'll cool down from this solid solution, uh, this gamma phase, this austenite, uh, through the eutectic uh, point, and you're going to form uh, at the grains of the of existing austenite, a eutectic structure, right? So I am I'm going to be forming ferrite grain, or ferrite particles, and cementite particles, and that means that the carbon needs to diffuse from the austenite into the cementite particles and out of what will become the ferrite regions. And this crystal structure is called perlite. Perlite, I guess it looks like mother of pearl when you polish it and look at it under a microscope, it's going to have that its name. Um, and again, you're getting diffusion of carbon out of the ferrite into the neighboring bands of cementite. Uh, cementite is much, much higher percent carbon. Remember, it's 6.7% carbon. Ferrite's only 0.2. And so the bands of cementite are about one-eighth the thickness of ferrite. Um, just because you can pack so much more carbon into a smaller space when the, when the concentration is that much higher. Okay, that's only at, you only get pure perlite right at the eutectic composition. If you are higher or lower than that, then you're going to form a more complicated microstructure um, that should be, uh, that we talked about previously, and we're going to recycle some of those ideas. Um, here, the main differences are that we're not going from a liquid, we're going from one solid to two different solids. So we have an existing grain structure of austenite, which means that when we pass into this region, we're going to have austenite and ferrite. And those ferrite grains are going to have a tendency to nucleate at these high energy and grain boundaries and grow from there. So we have growth of ferrite at the grain boundaries, and then as we pass through um, into the, um, which means that right as we're moving through this region, just like we saw before, 
um, we are uh, rejecting carbon into the austenite that remains and it's becoming higher percent carbon eventually it will cross at the eutectic composition and so after we have solidified some of these uh, ferrite grains we'll fill in the outside fill in the rest of that austenite with the perlite uh, microstructure leaving us something like this where we have ferrite um, grains which we call, we call hypo eutectoid ferrite um, and then uh, surrounded by the the perlite and like we saw before, we can define these regions. So here they use TUV instead of QRS, but the same idea applies. This is a weight percent of perlite, weight percent of proeutectic um, ferrite. Um, and uh, if you go to the other side of the eutectic point, we have a similar uh, scenario, except we are nucleating cementite grains at the grain boundaries of austenite and then filling in the, inner, the rest of those uh, austenite material with the perlite at the eutectic point. And again, this is, this is all predicated on slow cooling. These are equilibrium microstructures. Um, if we cool faster, we get other microstructures. We get um, different temperatures, these transformations happening at different temperatures, right? Uh, you only get growth of perlite right at this 727 degrees if you cool it slowly enough, right? If you cool it faster, you're going to cool it down past that point and it's going to solidify at a lower temperature. Um, you also get phases that don't exist here, right? So later on we'll talk about um, other phases with faster cooling rates like martensite, if you've ever heard of that, um, that don't exist on the phase diagram, right? Because they're not equilibrium structures, they're not equilibrium microstructures. And my last point here um, is that these phase diagrams, this is an iron, iron carbide phase diagram, right, or iron carbon. There's not any other alloying elements in here. If you add in those alloying elements, you need a different phase diagram. So you're going to have a phase diagram for every different steel alloy out there, right, and there are many of them. Um, and uh, generally, they're going to have the same general shape, the same general types of features, but the exact temp temperatures and compositions where those features occur will change, right? So here we see in this chart that as you add different alloying elements, the eutectoid temperature shifts, right? So to pick an example, let's just say uh, we're adding chromium, right? So chromium is uh, one of the main alloying elements to create stainless steel. And so as we're adding chromium, we see that the eutectoid temperature is increasing, right? It goes from 727 with, with just iron and carbon, right? Say up to, so what is this? 850 or so with about 14% chromium, right? And so other alloying elements increase that eutectoid temperature much more rapidly, and some actually bring it down even lower. Um, adding alloy elements not only change the eutectoid temperature, but they shift the eutectoid composition, right? So basically, you can move around that eutectic point both in composition and temperature by adding various um, alloying elements, right? And also, let's not forget that we're not just adding one alloy, alloying element, right? So uh, with a lot of alloys, you have a few major alloying elements, but then you know, a small percentage of lots of other things. Um, some some steels you'll see you know have half a dozen different major components, um, and so you really need a phase diagram for each individual individual alloy. Um, but in general, what you see here in the iron carbon phase diagram, right, the features are the same, the microstructures are very similar. It's just that the temperatures and the compositions where those transitions occur will shift, sometimes quite substantially.